Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. Oops, just playing around with something. Don't be alarmed, it's just a computer. Oh, come on. Right. Oh, you're messing me about. I want it to be fit screen, that's it. 99%. I want it to be 100%. Anyway, doesn't matter. So, the only listen to this or watch this when... <sighs> you can safely... Um, close your eyes fall asleep do whatever is necessary uh, for you to be comfortable really and don't drive tractors okay I should reframe that if you're a farmer I don't mean never I just don't drive tractors during the recording you know, when, when you're listening to it otherwise you might end up Plowing your neighbour's field. And it's not a euphemism. I mean, literally, you could be plowing their field and doing all that work for nothing. You know, if you fell asleep and you end up, all of the neighbours waking up, so I can't believe the whole of the country has been ploughed. But who did it? And you'll be at home thinking, oh no, all that work I did. I'm not going to get paid. If only I'd listened to Jason and just kept my eyes open. No, I'm not saying list keep, just don't play it unless you can close your eyes. Uh, also, same goes if you're watching on YouTube. Please subscribe. Um, so this is, I think, I think, I think, I think. Oh, my God. I think this is number 99 which isn't bad is it really you think I've probably been doing this for a year now if I remember correctly I started these in February or March last year and now it's the 19th of February 2019 and here I am number 99 oh I can't stop but yawn these sessions make me yawn they do so I kind of wanted the 100th one to be special but I don't really know how it could be <laughs> how could it be any more special than any of the others they're all special in their own way that's what my mum used to say to me we're all special in our own way we've all, got, we've all got our own little talents one day Jason you'll find out what yours is it's like thanks mum I'm 39 uh, so yeah so here we are together gathered together and <laughs> in a bit I will stop yawning I can just get on with it so I don't know what the I don't even know how many of these I was going to do when I first did it it was just an idea, let me bore you to sleep, because I realised that, I think what I did was I was trying to do a sleep session or a relaxation session or something like that, and I ended up just yabbering on about nothing for whatever time it was. And it, instead of deleting it, which is what I would normally do, I thought, oh, maybe I can use it. Maybe if I give it the title, let me bore you to sleep, then it means I haven't wasted the last 50 minutes. And 
it went from there. And what's strange is they are becoming more popular over time. The deep sleep whisper ones are still the most popular ones that I do, but the let me bore you to sleep have become more um, listened to, more downloaded uh, than they were, which I'm, uh, I'm pleased about, obviously not, not wide awake about, but I'm pleased. So therefore I will continue. If if I was doing this and I got to ninety nine and I was still only had like five people listening, then I would have got I wouldn't be doing them. But uh the viewership and audience has to grow. Otherwise is there's no point. It has to it can't sort of stay at the same. I mean, admittedly, I suppose if it stayed at the level it is now and it didn't grow or, or change, I'd have to continue because there's a lot of people that maybe are depending upon me producing new material. But it's nice to see growth. It's nice to see uh, progression, I think. Uh, to know that what I'm doing is useful and reaching a wider audience. So my request from you is to please share what I do on your Facebook page or your Instagram or wherever you socialize online. If you do like what I do, if you generally like what I do, please share my podcast, MP3s, my website or my YouTube channel, the videos. Please share it. Be my... Uh, promoter or you know if you do like what I do because that would be good I think that would be really cool because I can't really afford to do adverts I have done adverts in the past when I was what year is it yeah even going back to probably two thousand and. Nine, I think, maybe earlier, maybe 2008, I used to do Google Ads for my website. 2009, 2010. Um, in 2012, which was the height of my popularity regarding probably the website and the YouTube channel, because I'd been quite stable with the stuff that I'd done. I'd uh, had a half a million views on my YouTube channel. I'd had it for about 18 months. So I was quite pleased with how it was going. And so I was advertising the website as well, which I get, yeah, probably also had links to the YouTube videos. And so, yeah, so it's all kind of, there are ways of doing it, but I just, it's very businessy, and I kind of like prefer someone just to take control of that side of things and just, you know, just get the audience. Instead, I've just done it the really the hard way, a very long thirteen year way. And amongst those thirteen years, I've continuously been deleting stuff deleting channels, deleting, changing the website. I've changed it about 85 times in the last 13 years. So every time I change it, the links to the pages get deleted and they're no longer valid. So it's, it's weird, really. So I got my little pad, my little le electronic pad in front of me, which is a new thing that I've been doing. And it's not so much that I'm preparing what I'm going to say, but just so I've got an idea, you know, uh, because the more regularly I make a recording, not, not these, not the let me bore you to sleep, but the uh, deep sleep whisper or the uh, short anxiety relief, which I've started, or anxiety reduction, 
So I did the fourth one today. I need to have a little bit more focus on what I'm doing. So I started to write down, you know, just literally before I start the session, write down roughly what I'm going to focus on and then sort of doodle a little bit while I'm talking, a little bit, just to sort of, okay, what can I say? Um, What did I say? Just so I can kind of keep track of it. And I thought I'd do that with this, but it's not working. This this doesn't... Uh, I suppose I could tr- try, you know, but this is a very directionless recording. I think if I started trying to be uh, cohesive <laughs> and structured with these recordings... I think they would die out. I don't think I could do it. I don't think um, if I knew what I was going to talk about before I started, that'd be probably difficult. I, mean, I don't have a script. I've never had a script, uh, but I'm trying to. I'm trying to get a little bit more organised in certain aspects of what I do, but. With the with these ones, this is free form talking rubbish, kind of. Uh, although I can choose a subject and talk about it. So, for example, I had someone on Facebook ask me to talk about because I put a, I put a post on Facebook saying, "What would you like me to talk about on my Let Me Bore You to Sleep recordings? Is there anything you'd like me to talk about?" So I had a couple of people. One person said, well, it's three people, but one said, can you talk about what you would do if you won the lottery? No, not won the lottery. No, is it? If you were going to get £100,000, yeah. Oh, yeah, you get £100,000, but you have to spend it in one week and have nothing to show for it. Um, but I'm just thinking afterwards, this right now, I said, otherwise you don't get anything. The thing is, if someone's given you £100,000 and you spent it on stuff and and you haven't correctly spent it, you've not lost anything because you've still spent it, haven't you? Um, you can't take back the money. So yeah, that wouldn't work, would it? Unless it was like a... Uh, Brewster's millions you know with Richard Pryor where he had to spend well did he have to spend 20 million to get 200 million dollars something like that and he had 30 days to spend uh, you know loads of money but he couldn't have any anything to show for it and at the end of it, he'd get paid like 10 times the amount. And I think he did exactly what anyone else would do and he just took the, he took the opportunity because let's face it, it'd be brilliant fun, wouldn't it? Do you imagine someone saying, oh, there you go, there's 10 million. You've got to spend it in the next 30 days. You can go anywhere in the world, you can do anything you want, but at the end of the 30 days, you've got to have no money in your pocket. I'd I'd take the the challenge. It'd be fun. I'm not sure if the uh, the day after it ends would be very much fun, but... Imagine saying, okay, well, I'll book a helicopter now to take me to wherever you want to go. I think if you've got that kind of money and you've got 30 days to spend it, you might as well decide what you want to do and spend the rest of your life doing 
if you know what you want to do and then use that money to meet the people that can help you. So if you want to work in Facebook, for example, and that's your dream to work in, in Silicon Valley in America, then you could use that money to woo uh, Zuckerberg and like give him money, instead of not give him money, but sort of kind of take you for lunch and, you know, spend 40, 50, 100 grand on lunch to take him out and say, look, I really love what you do, I really love to work for you, um, please give me the opportunity. You can bombard him with flowers for 30 days and at the end of it, you end up with no money, but you end up might end up with a job, which will be a dream, the dream job for you, maybe. Just as an example. Or you could use that money. There might be someone that you're in love with. And or someone that you're already with, and you could get married. You can have the biggest wedding ever. Because a wedding's a useless waste of money, isn't it? So you could use and there's nothing to show for it. So you can spend all that money on a wedding. And you can invite people and you can do the thing that the annoying thing that no one really likes is when they get a wedding invitation. First of all, it's like, oh, not another wedding. That's another present I've got to buy. And then they see that it's going to be in Spain. So, okay, so I've got a wedding, but now I'm going to have to travel to another country. So that's an extra few hundred quid, and I've got to pay for a hotel. It's like, okay... I thought the wedding was about, meant to be about you. It's now turned into about us. It's like not, not good. One of my cousins got married in Switzerland. I don't think they had that many people turn up. It's just it's, it's like get married in the country where you're, unless you live. I suppose if you live in Switzerland, it's different. But if your family live in Japan, perhaps you don't get married in India. You know, you perhaps you might go to go to Japan and get married, just so that the people that you want to go and see you will, uh, can visit and travel. I love giving advice, wedding advice. That could be my job, like a wedding advisor. Get more balloons. That could be my advice. <laughs> Don't do it. So, yeah, so you could waste your money by getting married. And then, so you can't buy a house. I can imagine that. So you spent and had the most extraordinary, extravagant wedding with lakes of chocolate and, uh, you know, if you've um, paid Ed Sheeran to come and play songs for you, or in fact you might have just paid him just to stand there in his underpants and not play any music, yeah, but you paid him so much that he's willing to do it, and you just you do all that and you go on a lovely beautiful holiday to the most amazing holiday destination for your honeymoon uh, like Bournemouth or you know Leeds or somewhere like that and then you get back to your one bedroom flat which before you had all this money was absolutely a wonderful place to live and you really enjoyed it but now you've had all this luxury for 30 days and now you're back because you couldn't buy anything you couldn't buy a new house you couldn't buy a new home you couldn't buy a new car because then you know because that, that you'd have something to show for the money so you know you wasted it on a wedding and now you're in that flat and you might not have been living together before. But now you're, you're wedded. 
your marriage, you, um, you know, most people uh, live together when they're married, in my uh, knowledge base. Unless someone sees himself as other than that, you know, they might... Uh, What's the right phrasing? Um, I forget it, but they might. Yeah, I think my ideal situation is what Woody Allen, Woody Allen did. I should fra- rephrase that quickly and tell you exactly what I mean. Um, so he married someone, and he lived across the park, like in New York. I don't know which park it is, but New York is a park. It might be called New York Park. But he lived in a, an apartment across the park from his wife, who'd also lived in an apartment. And I'm making this little bit up there, but they could see each other. They could wave to each other. I don't know if that ever happened. And I thought that would be quite a good scenario, be quite a nice scenario to not have to again this this probably sounds bad but not have to see see the same person every day that's how maybe I could reword it to not have to would be nice to probably have a little break every now and then and then when you do see each other it can be butterflies and the excitement like the first time you met all over again (laughs) <laughs> it could be it could be brilliant I always wondered what to do with my counselling skills but I reckon marriage advisor that could be my next step because when I was a counsellor because I'm technically I am a counsellor but I'm not I'm qualified but I don't do it anymore I haven't done it for four years so or however long so I'm technically um, I don't know unemployed counsellor or I don't know however you want to think of it and people used to ask me do you specialise like what kind of counsellor do you mean what kind of counsellor I'm counsellor they don't realise that actually be and you know to train as a counsellor that's you can counsel anybody you know I've got a degree three years full time university you got you can counsel anybody of any age it's not really specialist um, but then if you go and work in a hospice or you go and work with people of elderly age or work with young people you can get extra training to you know if you're working with people with autism special needs people you know in a hospice environment so you can get or drug and alcohol dependency you can get specialist training in that or if you work in that environment that is something I guess you specialize in so I could be a marriage guiding counsellor guidance guidance I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to... I found it sometimes quite difficult to separate being a counsellor from being a human being. Because you've got the... You know, like the human mind, which likes to overreact to things. Uh... I suppose it's like the tabloid newspaper brain. That kind of over-exaggerating certain facts in order to make things uh, fantastical, you know? And chaotic. There's a very kind of chaoticness to that as well, I think. And gossipy and you know kind of 
So as a human being, I think we've all kind of got that within us. It's just standard. I think I think we kind of seem to be born into it, or born with with that ability to to find other people's misery interesting for some reason. Uh, I don't so much, but sometimes I do. So I. I think it's not so much that I don't find other people's misery interesting. I just don't find other people interesting. So that's that's probably my... Someone said to me the other day, they said, well, that, that's... Uh... So how can you devote your life and all your energy and time to helping people, yet not be interested in people, but not, not particularly like people not not be interested in them or he, he, he said to me that's a contradiction I said yeah but I, I can't I can't help that I can't help that I have zero interest in other people pretty much I've got very very I've got a very huge lack of interest in Humans, I'll be honest. It's I'm now at an age where I can be honest. It's always been the same my whole life. I've always, oops, I just hit the microphone. Sorry, my whole life I've always been the same since I was a kid. It's, but I care about people to an extent. You know, if someone fell over, I'll be the first person there to help. If I can, unless of course I'm further away, then I can't be, can I? But you know, I remember a couple of times it was, it was a really windy day, and this woman was rolling. <laughs> it's going to sound really bad, so I'm not. I'm trying not to laugh. She wasn't hurt. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was at a tri- it was at a bus station, and I was just walking towards the bus station, and this woman. It couldn't even see it was a woman, to be fair, because of the distance. And, and it, was, it was that kind of wind where the paper was just blowing everywhere. And, and she was rolling around on the floor, like being blown around. And people were just walking past. That's why I thought, um, I kind of, are my eyes, am I, seeing, am I seeing right? Because I wouldn't walk past someone like that. You know, it's just, just why would anyone? But... People were just ignoring her, so I went over, I helped her, and as soon as I walked over and helped her, other people came, um, and I helped her up, and she was okay, I think, she might, I don't know if she was, she might have been injured, I don't remember, uh, oh yeah, what I did, I took her to the, the bus, because I had like this, part of the bus station, they had a bus, uh, it's like a hut, um, like a porter cabin thing. Um, if you've ever been on a building site it's the place you go to to go to the toilet it's that kind of thing but they they sat in there and helped customers with their bus inquiries and um, directions as well I imagine probably so yeah I just took her over and they I think they might have called an ambulance for her or something but I just couldn't believe it. It was just funny to watch. I had no idea that a human being was connected to this at all until I got closer. Because I, I would, it just looked like there was a... So if you're not in England, you won't probably understand, might not understand this, but Guy Fawkes. Um, a Guy Fawkes is a... It's kind of like a... I suppose the closest thing would be a... A scarecrow, it kind of thing. You'd have a, it's like a human-shaped make-believe thing, but it's usually done with paper inside rather than straw. And you put it on top of a bonfire, and you set it on a light on November the fifth every year to celebrate a failed terrorist attack back in sixteen hundreds or whatever. Um. So it looked like that. It looked like someone had just uh, 
made somebody made of paper because of the way it was blown around or the way she was blown around it was because I was just walking normally and I'm heavier now than I was then but the wind didn't seem that strong but maybe she was just I don't know maybe she had helium inside her maybe she, <laughs> maybe she'd been sucking on some like a helium balloon and um Swallowed a helium balloon. So, it's so what my description there was an example of me being compassionate, and I just realised that it hasn't come across as possibly as compassionate as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so, I'll just hope that you're asleep by now, so I can just move across from that. And. Um, so I've seen a few people fall over. I'm sure we all have over the years. And uh, there is this, it's outside the Tesco where I lived. I didn't live in Tesco, but it, Tesco's is a, it's a supermarket in England. There might be in other countries, I don't know. But there's... Uh, they have little stores, like little versions of the superstore. So the big superstore, the supermarket's massive. And then they've got the little ones, which are just uh, bigger than an average corner shop. Probably twice the size, perhaps, of an average corner shop. About the same size as an average small co-op. Again, that might not mean anything to you if you don't know what a co-op is. Um, I used to work in a co-op back in April 1997 no 1998 I worked there it's quite weird because I remember the I don't know if it's the person that gave me the job but the area manager was called Mr Cook and he was this little man and he might have been the same height as me or even taller but you know some people look little he just looked little. Again, he might have been taller than me or the same height, but he just, I don't know, something about him that just seemed short, which was, it didn't matter, but he was um, not the most friendly person that I've ever met. He's, he took his job very seriously, which is fair enough. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you don't get to become an area manager unless you do the job properly, I imagine, to his kind of. But he was, uh, the people that worked there were just a bit, had a little bit of fear towards him. And I oh, know, Cookie's come in. Cookie's come in, I'll be saying, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I could do a little snack. And I said, no, Mr. Cook. So, oh, okay. Why don't you just call him Mr. Cook then? I was all excited. I put the kettle on and everything. You know I like cookies. And they said, yeah, we do still have cookies as well. The bakery, they delivered. You you, un, you unpacked the bakery delivery. You do it every morning. That's why you get here at half an hour before we open the doors. You unpack all the bread, the cookies, the cakes. I said, yeah, I know, but... It seemed like it, it was quite a good little pun... What do you mean, pun? I said, well, because I'm doing this recording. You know, it's uh, doing one of my Let Me Bore You to Sleep sessions. And it's going to be in 30, about 31 years' time I'll be doing this. And I just, I thought it would be a nice little pun. I'll, what I'll be doing with the recordings, I'll be just telling random stories about the past making a bit of stuff up telling some truths you know if bit, not confessional uh, there'll be no point where you hear I've sinned please forgive me because um, I guess that's a different place to do that but this is more that's why so I, that's why I did the cookie kind of joke it was not funny though, was it? 
I know it's there, yeah, but you got to be there. You, in the future, things are different. What, you mean that like they like stuff that isn't funny? Well, no, this isn't about being funny. This is just about... Um, um, I don't know what it's about anymore. It's it's about just talking. And um, it's more than... Because I call it let me bore you to sleep, as I told you. And it's it is it started off being me boring you to sleep. Well, I can see how you would because you are quite boring. I think, yeah, thank you, thank you. And uh, you can it's kind of grown into something else. And some of the feedback I get is that people like to listen because it's a distraction. Why, why did you say distraction with that high bit pitched bit? I said, I don't know. I wasn't planning that. It just happened. It's like my voice is de-breaking. I'm going to go back to having a high pitched voice again. Which won't sound very good on these recordings. Um, so yeah, they kind of changed, developed, grown into something that I didn't really still not really sure what there's more than just being bored by me to go to sleep so those that are up for being bored I think I produce the goods because nothing I say is going to be of any interest to anyone least of all to me but actually that's not true because when I, I know from experience when I tell people stuff about my life that's interesting to me their eyes glaze over. My life is not interesting to other people and what I do, things that interest me don't seem to interest other people. And I realise it also it's also the thing, if you mention hypnosis to people, straight away, especially if they don't know you, straight away they're Sometimes, like in person, I mean, sometimes a little bit on guard. You know, wondering, like, oh no, he's looking into my eyes and he's talking, what's he doing? Like, I'm doing something unusual, which I'm not. You know, I just, I, what are you doing? You're trying to do something, you're looking into my eyes, I think you're trying to hypnotize me. So I'm not, I just want to know, can I borrow some toilet paper because I've run out and I need to go to a toilet. Have you got a spare roll? I'm not trying to hypnotise you. It's, uh, that wasn't in the shop because they don't just give you toilet paper. That's one of the hard sides of being in a shop, working in a, a business situation is you can't just give stuff away. I used to. I used to work in a pub. And I don't know if you can even imagine this. If you're if you're under the age of fifty or forty, this might be completely out of out of your uh, imagination. Because when I was in a pub when I first started in a pub, I had to add up everything. I literally had to add up everything that I was that I was um, serving the customer and put it in as a full amount into the till. Because the other people were also using the same till and they couldn't wait around for it to be added all up. So I had to add it up in my head. So four cranberries, blah, blah, 15 pints of lager, blah, blah. And I think it turned into a, into some kind of a game for the people that visited, you know, the customers, because they knew that I kept getting it wrong. But they shot themselves in the foot though, because 
as humans sometimes do, they mess things up for themselves by being extra greedy. So I used to charge less than I should have done for, let's say for a customer come in, they'd have five pints of lager. At that time, it was probably less than a pound a pint, I reckon, back then. So let's say it was a pound. It would have been less than that, probably. So, so that's five pound. So I charge them three pound 30, <laughs> because that's how I added it up in my head. So they'd charge, so they'd, so they'd give me a five pound note. I'll give me, I'll give them back one pound 70. Uh, and they'd be going back to their table laughing and happy and like probably making fun of me and whatever. And then later on, maybe the same day, maybe a different day, they'd come in and they'd ask for the same thing, five pints of lager, which should be five pound. Last time I charged less, but this time I, I add it up differently. I say, that's oh, gonna be four pound 10, please. It's still 90 pence less than it should be. What happened now is, you wouldn't even believe it, they would complain to the manager and say, he charged us three pound 30 last time for five, now he's charging us four pound 10. And the manager would say, well, the real price is five pound. And the customer's argument meant nothing because basically I was in error and I was charging the wrong amount. So these customers, apart from getting me in trouble, well, I got myself in trouble, but um, they lost out because if they'd have kept quiet, they could have ended up having those, you know, really cheap drinks. But the greed, it was the greed in them. Very greedy. Mm. <laughs> so, I think it's part of it for me was the the having to add up stuff on the spot, you know. And I've had a few I've had a few um, jobs in bars over the years. So it's not, you know, that was my first, and I absolutely didn't like it at all. And I didn't, I thought that it'd be social and I'd meet people and they'd like me, or maybe, maybe meet a girl, and have, you know, but nothing like that happened. It was, I basically picked the worst bar, the worst pub in the town. It was a dive, absolute dive, all the rough, it went in there. It was. It wasn't a place. I think about five women went in there, and it was mainly just men, builders, and you know, and other people, and other people that were there all day because I didn't have anything else to do. And yes, yeah, so it wasn't very much fun for me. And there was a lot of people trying to be aggressive, and that's that's another thing. It's like, oh, I can't be. I don't like being around people that are drinking or drunk. And but then I got a, I got a job in Butlins as a bar bar person. Quite a few years later, so that was in ninety eight. And then I got a job, not ninety eight eighty eight. I got a job in a pub in nineteen ninety five. But it was in a a bar in in Butlins. Well, it's a few different bars. I just can't went to whichever one they wanted me to work in. And it was the busiest. I don't think anyone will ever in the world work in a busier pub, a busier bar than Butlins. The amount of people. So many people, non-stop. You know, thousands and thousands of people, non-stop. I would have took... Luckily, we had decent tills at that point. I was still making errors and stuff, but it was a case of 
uh, put in, you know, you had your tool and you put in what you wanted for each, you know, for each person. So it's a lot easier. And I did all right. I was there for a while. Didn't enjoy it, but well, I enjoyed parts of it. But I'm better with things when they're just. I think it's something about serving people drinks uh, off the top shelf, you know, with the whole uh, the liquors, the the whiskers, not the whiskers, <laughs> the whiskers, the liquors. I think the cats when I said liquors, uh, the you know, like vodka, um, brandy, and all that stuff, and just. Just, yeah, just like, oh, just wine. Wine's another one. Can't you just have lager? Just have lager. In fact, have a bottle. A bottle of lager. That should all, all should be served in a pub or in a bar. It's just lager. Everyone will get served quicker. Or have the wine on a tap. The same as the lager is. None of this bottle opening, none of this stuff, just on a tap, in a glass, there you go, bye. No queuing. That way you haven't got people standing in the back waving a ten pound note as if they want me to do a lap dance. Can't do I can't do a dance right now, mate. I'm busy, I'm working. Come and see me in twenty minutes when the show starts. So yeah, it's it's a that was an okay job. I got I did work in another bar in a club, and I didn't officially work in the bar, but I used to help out when it was busy, and uh, so I would take drinks to people's tables. I'd also uh, I'd go to one part of the bar and say, if you want pints of lager, come and see me. And someone had come and said, well, I need some wine. I said, no, I'm just doing pints. Because it was easier to add up. It was easier to work it out. And I was pouring the pints there. And that's all I was doing. And just get rid of people. Get, get them done and sorted. And not everybody liked my way of doing things. But I found it easier for me. And I was just helping out. So if you're the one helping out, then you kind of decide what you do, don't you? In a sense. It's like if you do voluntary work. If you go into a voluntary workplace and they start to tell you what to do and start bossing you around and getting you to do horrible jobs, like, no, I don't think you understand the concept of this voluntary work. It's What it means is I come along, I get paid, and I do what I want to do. Yeah. Controversial. So, I actually got a job in a bar when I was at university. I lived across the road from a pub. I used to go in there, and when I say I live across the road, I mean literally a 20 second walk from my house to where, where the pub was. And my landlord, he actually once got a taxi home from the pub <laughs> it's, 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 it was like a legend a legendary story he was so drunk he had to get a taxi home and lived across the road but I um, I was at university and I didn't have a job at the time I was just you know uh, I was in there talking and the bar manager or the owner actually of the place said to me do you do you want a job here? I said, oh, I don't know. He said, um, I think he said, can you pour a pint? I said, yeah, but isn't that your job? You know, what's the point of me paying you money if I've got to pour my own pints? And he said, no, no, no. No, don't be like that. And he said, uh, so he called me across, I went across the bar, um, not like Starsky and Hutch and we're going back but not but you know I went through the hatch not the hutch the hatch and I did a 
poured a pint. I poured thousands of pints over the years. And, you know, I know how to, I know how to give good head. You know, that's all I'm saying. It's, uh, there's some special techniques you can have to do that. But I know how to pour a pint. And uh, he was impressed. And he said, well, you can start tomorrow. And this was on Saturday evening, I think, or Saturday afternoon. He said, you can come in for a trial on Sunday if you want. Sunday, because that's the busiest time of the year, of the year, of the week for them. Because they had, uh, used to cook meals, roast dinners and stuff. So it was very busy. And they had two bars within the pub. So it was the, the sa- saloon and the other part with the pool table and the younger, younger people. And so I used to, uh, you know, I said, cool. And Sunday came. And I looked at my clock. And what I did is I phoned in ill. I did. It was my first day. It was a trial. It wasn't even like a proper a proper job yet. But it was a trial and my first shift. And I, I phoned in ill. So I can't, I'm too, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm unwell. Now you should have seen the look on their faces on the the, the barman, you know, the, the landlord's face at the pub that evening when I walked in. Sat, you know, so can I have a pint please? And they, him and my landlord, like the, of where I lived, they just were just in shock that I could be that brazen to phone in ill, leave them short of staff on the busiest day of the week and then walk in in the evening and order a, order a drink. And I said, oh, sorry about that. And I think we all, they ordered a kebab. So yeah, that's the end of that story. It ended with a kebab. But What was I to do? <laughs> it's you know that was the last. I just couldn't face it. I couldn't face it. I just couldn't. Yeah, I didn't. I don't know. I think I'd have been all right because it's. I think because it's a small pub. Everyone in there generally seemed quite friendly and. You know, it was, it was an okay place, and everyone knew my landlord and my landlady, so they they were kind of fairly friendly to me as well. Uh, so you know, it's I'd have been all right there, but I just I couldn't get out of bed. And he didn't offer me another shift either, so I never got a chance to show show off my uh, bar skills. Obviously, he didn't believe in second chances. <laughs> so this Tesco, what I was going to talk about was the, this lady, she fell over outside Tesco's. And because I was talking about not really, you know, being a really caring about people and stuff, really. But... In the moment I do, and this woman, she was laying down on the floor. She was with her husband, they were both elderly. He was probably, they're probably both in this sort of 70s, 80s, probably 80s I'd say. She was lying there, it was cold, and people just walking past. Of course some people stopped and, and, I was going to say her husband just spat at them, but he didn't. That's just made up. And but what I thought it dawned on me that actually, for her, because she was embarrassed, she was cold. Uh, one of the shops had a blanket and they put it over her and put a pillow under her head. But what she didn't have, the one thing she no one could offer her, was her perspective. She was lying on a cold pavement and everyone else was standing up. 
So what I did is I lied down next to her. I didn't cuddle up to her or anything like that, because that would have been inappropriate. But I laid down next to her. And I might have held her hand, I'm not sure. But I just started talking to her. I, already, I talked to her beforehand. I didn't just walk up and lay down, because that would have been a bit weird. But I'd already been talking to her for a few minutes. And I waited with her until the ambulance got there. So I think she'd broken her ankle or something. And I just talked to her. I made her laugh. And it meant that she wasn't alone. I know to a degree she had a husband there, so she probably didn't feel alone. But she didn't feel alone as in she wasn't the only person laying down on the pavement. People were no longer just looking at her. Especially as I had no trousers on. No, I did have trousers on. I made that up. So, so there's, there's, there's uh, something in there within me that cares in the moment. But do I care what she's doing now? No, I don't. I, I wish I were. I hope she's fine. But I don't, I'm not thinking about her. So I suppose I'm kind of, maybe I'm just the same as everybody else. Everyone thinks that way, but it's just, I think it's nice to be there when people need it, like proper need it, not just, I think if you're there all the time, people need it all the time. Well, actually, I don't think any of us need anything all the time. We're so much stronger than we realise. So much more able to deal with stuff than perhaps we give ourselves credit for. I mean, you're amazing people. You really are. I don't have to be in your life to know that. This whole world is full of amazing people. And a few knobheads. Let's be honest. There are a few out there that are just complete knobs but they're not the majority the majority of people have got great qualities and they're doing the best that they can and I think the one thing that may be the majority of people perhaps share is that feeling that they're underappreciated or that they're not being appreciated at all perhaps so how can we change that perhaps what we need to do is appreciate ourselves Because let's face it, if you're, let's say you're an ambulance driver, a paramedic, you save someone's life, you move on to do the next call, call out, you know, you have to go and see someone else and you help them and you help someone else and eventually go home and you, you know, your shift is over and you get on with your life and you do what everyone else does and maybe you creosote the, the fence and Maybe you you collect stamps. Maybe you, you know you've got a hobby. You've you got children. You take your children to ballet, and you know whatever is going on in your life. It's up to you to realise that you're appreciated, and to realise that because you may not hear it enough, and maybe you hear it so much that you don't notice it anymore. Maybe you hear people say thank you so much that you don't hear it. Perhaps you could start hearing it again. Realising that it isn't the same as a customer buying something from a shop. You know, if you buy something from a shop, say some underwear, 
or some tampons or whatever you buy and you go to the shop counter you pay for it and they say thank you you know thank you is meaningless it doesn't mean anything they're not it doesn't it's not their money so you're not giving them any money they're just working there but it's just common courtesy it's decency and it's a social thing that we do and it's what the their employee would want them to do as well or employer rather but when someone says thank you for saving my child's life or thank you for saving my life thank you for resuscitating me or my friend or my wife or it's not the same thing it's just a standard social thank you it's important and it's meaningful and just because you may hear it lots of times doesn't diminish the energy and the importance of that thank you so that you can appreciate yourself more I'm going to go so thank you for listening hopefully you fell asleep through boredom if you didn't then yeah oh well I'll speak to you later bye